William Wilson, Part 4 As I ended the last part of my story, I was speaking of that terrible evening when I played cards with a young gentleman called Glendinning. We were in the room of one of my friends at Oxford University. I had just realized that the young man, weak of mind and weakened by wine, had allowed me to win from him everything he owned. I was still trying to decide what I should do when, as I said, the wide, heavy doors of the room were suddenly opened, every light in the room went out. But I had seen that a stranger had entered. He was about my own height, and he was wearing a very fine, long coat. The darkness, however, was now complete, and we could only feel that he was standing among us. Then we heard him speak in a soft, low, never-to-be-forgotten voice, which I felt deep in my heart. He said, Gentlemen, I am here only to do my duty. You cannot know the true character of the man who has tonight taken a large amount of money from Mr. Glendinning. Please have him take off his coat, and then look in it very carefully. While he was speaking, there was not another sound in the room. As he ended, he was gone. Can I, shall I, tell what I felt? Need I say that I was afraid, that I felt the sick fear of those who are judged forever wrong? Many hands held me, lights were brought, my friends looked in my coat. In it they found all the high cards, the valuable cards needed to win in the game we had been playing. Secretly using these cards, I could have taken the money of anyone who played the game with me. Mr. Preston, in whose room we were, then said, Mr. Wilson, this is yours. He lifted from the floor a fine, warm coat and said, We shall not look in this to prove again what we have proved already. We have seen enough. You will understand, I hope, the need for you to leave the university. At the very least, you must leave my room and leave it now. Down in the dust, though my spirit was, I might have tried to strike him for those words if, at that moment, I had not noticed something very surprising. My coat had cost more money than most men could spend, and it had been made especially for me. It was different, I thought, from every other coat in the world. When, therefore, Mr. Preston gave me the coat which he had picked up from the floor, I saw with terror that my own was already hanging on my arm, and that the two were alike in every way. I remembered that the strange being who had so mysteriously entered and left the room had had a coat. No one else in the room had been wearing one. I placed the coat offered by Mr. Preston over my own, and left his room. The next morning I began a hurried journey away from Oxford University. I ran, but I could not escape. I went from city to city, and in each one Wilson appeared. Paris, Rome, Vienna, Berlin, Moscow. He followed me everywhere. Years passed. I went to the very ends of the earth. I ran in fear, as if running from a terrible sickness and Still he followed. 
Again and again I asked myself, who is he? Where did he come from? And what was his purpose? But no answer was found. And then I looked with greatest care at the methods of his watch over me. I learned little. It was noticeable, indeed, that when he appeared now, it was only to stop me in those actions from which evil might result. But what right did he have to try to control me? I also noticed that although he always wore clothes the same as mine, he no longer let me see his face. Did he think I would not know him? He destroyed my honor at Oxford. He stopped me in my plans for getting a high position in Rome, in my love in Naples, in what he called my desire for too much money in Egypt. 